Nice to see you here today. Um, beautiful Icelandic morning. Uh, my name is Hjörtur Thor Steindorsson and I'm with Íslandsbanki. Uh, just a point of reference, uh, my name is another extremely easy to pronounce Icelandic name. And uh, if you want to chat later on, uh, please feel free to call me H, which is the uh, first letter in my name. All my English speaking friends and colleagues uh, call me that. Uh, what I wanted to discuss with you here today is obviously the title of my presentation is Financing Geothermal Power Plants, uh, a banker's view. I wanted to briefly give you an overview of Íslandsbanki, the bank that I represent here today. Uh, a few points on the Icelandic energy market and how geothermal plays a key role. Uh, trends in the uh, clean energy investment uh, globally. Um, different approaches in financing uh, geothermal power plants. And then lastly, I want to show you what we identify as the uh, critical financing gap in the uh, stages of, of geothermal power projects. Uh, first off, the standard uh, disclaimer, it's too early in the day for this, so we'll move on. This is Islas Banke. It's, uh, it's a full service bank in Iceland, uh, servicing households and corporates dating back to 1875. Uh, retail bank, corporate bank, full service corporate bank, which I'm a part of, uh, wealth management, uh, capital markets. Uh, the bank has total assets of about six and a half billion US, strong capital base, uh, international reach through our focus sectors, which are renewable energy and seafood. Uh, this is built upon uh, home market expertise and experience, decades of experience, uh, both in energy and seafood. In, in both sectors, we have dedicated teams focusing on these sectors. We have extensive network, both in Iceland and internationally. And we publicize regularly research material related to both these sectors. Uh, both for domestic markets and international markets. And just a point of reference, we have a recent report on the Icelandic energy market in English at our booth. Our booth is number 34 downstairs, and I encourage you to stop by if, you, if you'd like to grab a copy. Uh, a few points on the Icelandic energy market. It, it is unique in many ways. Uh, the keynote speakers touched upon this in their addresses earlier in this morning. Uh, we are one of the uh, leading countries in utilizing geothermal energy. Uh, and you can see this on the top picture here, how geothermal plays a massive role in, in our society. Uh, and it has uh, almost replaced oil and coal over the past several decades. And today, over 90% of all households are heated with geothermal energy. And it's interesting to note that it is estimated that the uh, annual savings in hard currency is about 60 to 80 billion ISK. And to put this in perspective, this is almost the same amount, or approximately the same amount as the total budget for the Ministry of Education, Science and Culture here in Iceland in 2012. Um, and, the, and the graph below is interesting as well. Uh, this shows the uh, power generation in Iceland over a 35 year period. And you can see the rapid expansion here over the past 10, 15 years, and how geothermal has played a bigger and bigger role uh, as, as a proportion of the, of the total. Uh, and I want to show you this graphically on the next couple of slides. Bjarni uh, Bjarnason at, at Reykjavik Energy uh, had uh, similar, similar pictures earlier on. I'm going to show you slightly different ones. But I, I think this is interesting, and I actually like how this emphasis is the uh, transformation that has taken place in Iceland due to geothermal. This picture is taken in 1933, uh, primary heating with coal. And the next picture is taken in Reykjavik. Uh, not today, but uh, last week, perhaps. Uh, we picked this picture actually because it shows the, uh, the beautiful conference facility we're sitting in here today, Harpa. But, but it's truly a, a transformation uh, for our society. Uh, next, I wanted to share with you a few points on the Icelandic energy market. Obviously, energy projects are controversials, uh, controversial in many, many, in many ways and in every country, and Iceland is no different. Uh, recently, there was approved in the parliament a master plan on energy 
development in Iceland. Uh, 16 project areas were approved for development. Uh, Íslandsbanki has identified 10 what we call near-term development projects. Uh, what is interesting is that out of those 10 projects, nine are geothermal projects. And the estimated capacity uh, for those 10 projects is about 655 megawatts. And for those nine geothermal projects, it's about 560 megawatts. So it's a, it's a huge increase. We estimate that the uh, investment need for those projects is about two billion US dollars. What is also interesting is that here in Iceland, uh, the energy uh, project development has been in the hands of publicly owned energy companies in the past, and they have relied on financial support from either national or local governments, the municipalities, and due to the uh, rapid uh, expansion over the past several years, as you saw in the, uh, one of the graph earlier, uh, they are leveraged, so the question is if there's a need for a different financing approach going forward. Uh, there's been talk, obviously, about project financing, involvement of institutional and outside investors uh, in that regard, and Reykjavik Energy, for example, has, has said that uh, they're looking into a structure like this for their, uh, for their next project, and... Uh, and we believe that's, that's, that's probably a highly likely scenario. Here we have, I want to share with you the trend in global investment in clean energy, just to put this in perspective for uh, geothermal. Uh, the trend has obviously been, been upwards over the past eight years. And here we see uh, last year alone, it was about $270 billion worth of investment in this industry. And the capital came from several fronts, but what is more interesting is where it went. And here we see that wind and solar dominated this asset class, uh, and geothermal was a tiny piece of the total. Uh, and this, this obviously ties into some, some of the addresses earlier this morning, but I wanted to show you this just to uh, put geothermal in, in, in context globally. Uh, I wanted to share with you how we see the uh, geothermal project financing. There are several different approaches when it comes to financing geothermal projects, and it varies by countries and regions. Uh, here we have two different approaches. We have what we refer to as the, uh, the government-sponsored uh, approach, and then the private market approach. It's, it's almost at the uh, end of each spectrum. Uh, and we take Iceland as, as an example here. Obviously, it's close to us, and that's where the government is highly involved. Uh, it owns the utilities who actually are the developer of the project itself. The equity is, is provided either through the utility or through the, uh, through the government or the owner. And then it's construction financing obtained through development banks. The other end of the spectrum is the, uh, the private market approach. And we take the U.S. as an example. We have private developers who own the project and started off. We have the utilities who are actually the, uh, the power purchaser in this case. And the equity is provided by the developer himself or financial partners. And then at, the, at a later stage, they obtain construction financing through banks or other means. But these are two different approaches in, 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 these, uh, in these projects. And it's interesting to think about this in the context, for example, of the keynote speech from uh, the World Bank, uh, Dr. Indrawati, earlier on. Uh, next, I want to go through with you the way we see the, uh, the project life cycle for a geothermal power project. We identify uh, several stages ranging from the startup stage to exploration, pre-feasibility, uh, feasibility design and construction, and operation. And keep in mind, when I go through these uh, several slides, that this is a, a standalone project, more of, more of a, a private market approach in the, uh, in the approach for uh, project financing of geo geothermal. Uh, and I wanted to layer on top of this several items, and I'll go through it uh, in a few different ways. First, I want to layer on top of this 
the knowledge of the resource at a different stage. It is, it is important, obviously, but often uh, overlooked in these type of discussions. Uh, in, in our experience, obviously, the, the, the key stage is the feasibility stage, where you start to drill full-sized production wells, and you get a better sample of the resource. Uh, here we're showing that the, uh, the knowledge of the resource doubles from approximately 30% to 60%. And at this stage, a decision is made if, if the uh, project is, is a go or no go, so to speak. And, and then I, I want to show you something different. I want to layer on top of this the capital required during each stage and where it comes from. <coughs> The sources of funding in the beginning, uh, no real surprise. You got you got venture capital or development equity coming in at the at these stages. But during the feasibility stage, you obtain different type of financing. Oftentimes we see that standalone projects they run into problems at this stage because it's a lot more capital intensive stage. And the blocks uh, represented by the, these gray, gray blocks. It, these are proportionate to the capital needed during each stage. So you can see how much more capital intensive the feasibility stage is versus prior stages. So this is, this is, this is a huge step in, in, in the project life cycle for a geothermal plant. And this is obviously, this is expensive. If you don't have the equity yourself, uh, developers face heavy dilution, or if they're lucky enough to obtain uh, expensive debt financing, uh, which is scarce oftentimes. Then you have the uh, more uh, traditional capital structure. When you get into this stage of design and construction, and then you move from there into operation, and then you have permanent financing, a long-term permanent uh, capital structure as you begin to uh, operate and gen generate revenues. Then I wanted to layer on top of this, the probability of success. And this is of great interest to us, uh, and it should be for, for all of us in this room interested in geothermal. Uh, the line that I plotted here uh, is actually taken from a Deloitte report uh, done in 2008. Uh, about risk mitigation strategies, and, and it shows the probability of success for geothermal projects at different stages. Then we layer onto this the way we see the market perceiving this probability. And this is based upon our, our interviews and past experiences in, in several geothermal projects. And the market seems to look at this totally differently from uh, industry players and, and the actual probability if you have a good resource and, and everything is, is coming into play in, in, the decent, in, the, in the proper order. And this is what we identify as a critical financing gap for geothermal power projects. Uh, this is where most developers run into problems uh, in terms of financing. Uh, there remains this risk premia in the views of investors uh, during this stage. They're unwilling to take risk, uh, drilling risk, even though several production wells have been drilled, and, and it, it remains a massive, massive problem. So as we've identified this, this financing gap, there's a, there's a few points that I want to share with you. Um, the market, like I said before, ha seems to overestimate the risk for, for geothermal projects at this critical stage. Uh, the government in some markets does play an important role with subsidies, grants, what have you. Uh, oftentimes it's, it's back end loaded in nature, so, so it comes into play later on in the stage, so it doesn't really uh, help during this critical financing gap that I've told you about. Uh, so, with these government uh, subsidies being short-term in nature, the question becomes, where the market is unable to deliver, is it, is, is, is it uh, necessary for the government to, to play a role during this stage? Because we all know the benefits of geothermal. We saw it this morning 
and Iceland is a prime example uh, of benefits of geothermal. And the next question then becomes, does the industry need to rethink its business model when it comes to standalone geothermal power projects? Some, some financial innovation, if, you, if you'd like, has taken place. Um, we have seen some equipment suppliers providing some type of short-term uh, financing, venture financing. Uh, we have seen insurance companies looking at drilling insurance. This all helps. This, this helps uh, minimizing this financing gap that I told you about. But uh, it is interesting that, uh, that this possibly is, is, the, uh, is the bottleneck for these projects. So today I've discussed with you briefly the uh, Icelandic energy market and why geothermal plays a massive role, uh, how global investments have trended over the past few years and how geothermal, geothermal plays a small role in many ways, and two different approaches in financing geothermal projects and then uh, identified this financing gap which is oftentimes a bottleneck for these projects. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. I'd be happy to discuss this with you later on if you'd like. We have a booth downstairs. It's number 34. Thank you for your attention.